This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Saturday, September the 29th uh, in the year 2007 here at the Niles Public Library and we're meeting in the group study room off of the reference uh, department on the second uh, level and I'm uh, very pleased and privileged to be meeting today with uh, a veteran, Mr. Richard Regala, who's here with his uh, wife and his father, who was a uh, World War II veteran. And uh, we look forward to interviewing Mr. Regala Sr. In the, in the weeks to come. Um, Mr. Regala, Richard, was born in Chicago, Illinois, and he was born on the 13th of August, uh, 1947. And he has um, kindly consented to be interviewed for this project, and we're very grateful. Um, Mr. Regala, um, when did you enter the, the service? I was actually a Navy Reservist that went, uh, I came in September of 1966 as a reservist and attended meetings down at Monroe Harbor for a year and then I got papers to uh, go to in September of 67 to go to uh, Treasure Isle, San Francisco where I was in a transit warehouse for three weeks and then I received uh, orders to report to the USS Pueblo on Friday, October 13th, 1967. It was now if I may ask you, you were a reservist. How or why did you decide to become a, a reservist? Well, it was the buildup of the Vietnam War, and rather than get drafted, I, went, I said, well, I'll serve my country in another way. I'll go in the Navy, because I preferred the Navy. Now, your dad, um, who we mentioned in introducing this interview, he was a, a World War II veteran. Correct. And he served in the... Air Force. Air Force. But you didn't want to... The Air no, Force didn't I didn't really want anything to do with that. Or the Army. Right. So you chose the Navy. I chose the Navy. At all. In fact, I got my uh, draft papers a couple days after I got sworn into the Navy. And then a day after a cancellation of it. So I knew I was going to get drafted because the people then were either getting married or uh, going to college. And they didn't have to go into service. But I elected to do it. Um, could you swim? Yes. Sometimes. Oh yeah, when I was a little kid, we were at the lake all the time, so that's where the relation came. I mean, we go to uh, lakes in northern uh, Illinois or southern Wisconsin, and I learned to swim at a young age. So that's that's where the appeal was. I wasn't afraid of the water. Yeah. In fact, when we were going across the Pacific. I was in the Pacific Ocean once. We jumped off the ship. They once let us do that, and that was kind of a neat, you know, for a, for a while. We didn't stay in line, but we did jump in. It was, it was Being swimmers, swim. it wasn't uh, no right. fear. Right, yeah, it didn't bother me. What high school did you attend? I attended uh, Holy Trinity High School in Chicago. Is that down on Division? Or Division, somewhere? right off the expressway. It's still there after all these years, so most of them, a lot of them, have gone away, but Holy Trinity's still there. So. And you graduated from high school in? Uh, May 1965. 65. So did you have a draft number then, or was there a selective service given a number in the draft? Yes. What was yes. your number? Uh, well, I don't know if I had a number, but that was when they were basically anybody that turned uh, 18 had to be registered for the draft, and then, uh, you know, they were taking you unless you had uh, reason not to. Yeah, I was, um, I think I'm a little younger than you are, I recall being in college, and I had a draft number of 151. Ah, uh, okay, no, I never they had didn't the get number. Up, they didn't that get up later. that high. Yeah, that was later. That was later. They, they, yeah. Initiated. they were just taking anybody, everybody. This was during the when I signed up and everything, it was the premier buildup of the Vietnam War. I mean, they, they had built troops up to there, like 750 to 800,000 people were there. An unbelievable amount. It was the peak, right around the time it was time for me to serve. Your, your parents said they, they thought it was a good idea for you to go into the reserves there. There was, everybody at home thought it was a good idea. 
Well, yeah. yeah. You know, never knew what was going to happen. You know, reserves, I was going to serve two years active duty. Yeah. I knew I was going to do that, but little did we know. So you, you entered... So you entered the service then at, at Fort Sheridan, or it's a different process, or? Uh, well, I went... Or Great Lakes, then. Great Lakes is where I under, I went to uh, boot camp for a couple of weeks, and then I was aboard a ship in Portage, Wisconsin for a couple of weeks. That was early, like in, like, uh, 66, and then I attended meetings, uh, on in Monroe, Monroe Harbor or something, there's a uh, naval center there for a year. And then, then I went active duty where I went first to Frisco and then aboard the ship. So you, in the reserve, you began ba a kind of basic training? Uh, yeah, but it was only two weeks. Only two weeks and then right. Being a reservist, that's all that was required. So, two weeks of... Uh, at Great Lakes and two weeks on the ship, uh, for training that way. That's all the training I had for reservists. It was pretty, you know, then the Monday meetings, but that was, you know, nothing really special. So was there any, did you get any difficulty in making adjustments to uh, military life? Or most of the guys were pretty nice there. Uh, when, you're that, you know, when you're that young, you're flexible. You can kind of roll with it off. You know, I look back now, all this that happened, I was like, how did I get through it? So there were any uh, memorable uh, instructors or nasty uh, well, during, trainers or during uh, boot camp? Uh, we basically are our particular company scored real high because uh, he had gone over the records of what was going to be on the test the night before, so we all scored really high. <laughs> I mean, it was a real event, but this particular platoon leader, would, uh, his, his, class, his groups would always score the highest because of what he was doing there. But that was, I mean, something you just can't forget. I mean, we were up during the night and doing this in the middle of the night. And then the Cram test was like, yeah. right, cramming for the big test so you pass, you know. And that was in, in Wisconsin? That was in Great Lakes. That was in Great Lakes. Right. Yeah. yeah. So then um, within the Navy, do they do they direct you to a, to a position or a like, pharmacy or medic or? Uh, navigation or electronics or something? Oh, a board ship. Yeah. We were an intelligence gathering ship, but I wasn't on there for that purpose. I was on there as part of the deck crew, which is maintenance, ship maintenance, washing clothes, uh, painting, uh, serving food. That was my, I was very green, you know. So when you, when you come out of Navy boot camp or whatever the proper term is, you don't know yet what you're going to be in the Navy. Right, right. You have no idea. That's just uh, basic, just basic kind of training. So when you finish Great Lakes then you... Well, I was still working then and uh, went to the meetings for a year. And then you, when you, when you go into, when you called into the Navy proper active duty, uh, where are you sent then? We went to Treasure Isle, San Francisco. That's an in-transit warehouse, or warehouse area for people going into the military. They send you there until you get your orders. They basically process you to get you ready to send you somewhere. And were you still with the same group of guys from? No. No. It's all an individual thing. In fact, I had a friend that was my same age that when him and I signed up together. So he went there at the same time as me, but then he got orders to a different ship. But we did meet up once or twice before this all happened. So, sure. yeah. So you're in you're in San Francisco, and then you get assigned to the right to the to the Pueblo. Right. And it was ironic as heck that it was on Friday, October 13th. Oh, right, yeah. I'm superstitious. I will be for the rest of my life. I was born on the 13th. I went aboard a ship on the 13th. We were 
taken 13 days after we left port. On the 13th day, we got captured. We, uh, I received a Purple Heart when I got back. It was on the 13th, the notification. And my name, Richard Rogala, has 13 letters. So I'm very superstitious about the number 13. You were born 13. Well, that's what I said in yeah. the Yeah, wow. So I got all these 13s behind me, so it's kind of a neat little thing, and I'm still thinking it's not. And then her birthday is the same day as mine. August 13th. Yeah. So it just goes on and on. And we just start numbers. looking around about yeah. all this, about what uh, all these 13. So when it, for a lot of years there, when it came up, I was very careful on those days of what I did and all this kind of stuff because it was like, what's going to happen next? But in the last several years, I've adopted a thought process that something good's going to happen someday and it's going to happen on that date. Well. So the Pueblo um, sailed out of San Francisco? I reported to the Pueblo in San Diego. In San Diego. That's where it was at at the time. It came down. It was commissioned in Bremerton, Washington and they brought it down to San Diego, and that's where it was before we went across the Pacific. So it was a new ship? Uh, no, no, it was an old, it was built in Kewaunee, Wisconsin, and it was a cargo ship for a lot, like during the war and all that. They took it out of, mul they took it out of uh, service, and then they refurbished it and put it back into service. It wasn't too great of a thing. They, they jammed 83 people on a 200-foot ship. The racks in the, uh, where we slept were one on top of another, and that was the fourth one on up towards the ceiling, and I had about one foot between the bed and the ceiling, so I had to sleep flat. <laughs> and then there was a pipe coming across on the end of the rack, so I had to kind of sleep to the side, but that was the sleeping quarters I had to go through when I was on the ship. That was pretty unique. When you were in the, um, the basic training, did you have to learn to sleep in a bunk uh, or a hammock? Uh, in the Navy? Well, it was a bunk. Bunk, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that was a bunk and I was on the second, so I mean I got some... It's a quarter of a bunk. <laughs> I got some uh, experience with that, but I mean you had to climb up this ladder, you know, to get up to this thing. It was really... It's a good thing you weren't, uh, uh, you didn't suffer from claustrophobia. Uh-huh. And uh, we, I mean, it was such tight water, it was unbelievable how they got so many people aboard there. And why did there have to be so many people aboard the, the ship? I mean, well, there were, half of them were the, the intelligence people, and half of them were, you know, maintenance people. But the half were, half were, communications technicians. And they were the ones to do the work collecting the intelligence information. So that's why I would think there would have been so many. Because we were we also had two oceanographers aboard the ship that were not in the military that uh, were oceanographers. And they collected water samples and that was kind of a cover for the ship of what its main purpose was. So when you left, um, when you got your assignment to the Pueblo, you just figured, oh, this is just another, you weren't, you didn't, you didn't have any views one way or the other? I knew I was heading towards uh, Japan. That's where we were going to head to Yakuza, Japan, and we stopped in Hawaii. And I got fond memories of Hawaii because a lot of us turned legal age there, because the legal age there for anything was 20, not 21. Right. So we had some really, we stopped there for four days and we had some wonderful days there. About a quarter of the crew was about the same age as me. I mean, we were just kids, 20 years old. I was 20 years old uh, then, and actually while we were, while I was in North Korea during that year, I spent my 21st birthday there. Uh, was like a lot of the other guys did. So, Hawaii to Japan. Right. 
And you get shore leave in Japan, or you get to go in? We got to Japan in like early December, and we stayed there until early January. We spent the holidays in Japan. We headed out on our mission early January, January 5th of 1968. Our, this is when we first, uh, maybe that wasn't the date. Anyways, we got captured January 23rd. When you left Japan, did you know that you were going to be going into interesting waters? I knew nothing. The, the uh, communication technicians knew uh, a fair amount, but I knew nothing. I had no idea where we were going. And was that the case for most of the crew or half of the crew? Or? Uh, at least half of the crew or more. Yeah. So I should When this all started happening, it's like, what the heck's going on? What is this, what is yeah. this all about? And bits and pieces started coming out. So on the, your rank in the Navy was SK3. What does that denote? Is it, is Stork, is that ranking I didn't really get until after I was out. I was actually a seaman apprentice when this all happened. The lowest rank you could possibly be because of... So your typical day on ship would have been getting up at a certain time or getting up at a certain time, standing watch when we were when we were out to sea. I have uh, two four hour watches would be a typical day out at sea. Are you looking through binoculars or uh, you have binoculars and you're kind of just watching for what was going on. Because it was pitch black it could have been. Going out there when it was pitch black was just unbelievable. Your eyes wouldn't adjust. It was like walking in the dark and you couldn't see somebody. You had your eyes covered because we'd have to walk out to the uh, uh, area where we would be doing the watch at the front of the ship. There was a specific area for that. Do you have to report any funny sounds at night or anything? If anything we saw, we reported to the uh, the one that was uh, uh, steering the ship. Yeah, there was communications if we saw anything, you know. So I wasn't on watch when this all started to happen or anything. So, so what? What is this thing that's going to happen? What? What happens? Well, what was that day like? Well, first it was a joke, believe it or not, of what was going on. We didn't think anybody was serious. We uh, <coughs> were. Uh, there were torpedo boats that were taking pictures of us and eyeing us and everything. And These are North Korean. Uh huh. Then there, were shit, then there were planes overhead, you know, like three planes and uh, six torpedo boats, and they surrounded us, and um, we started heading out to sea, and then they decided they started firing upon us. What were you when it happened? I was, we were at general quarters, and I was, everybody was on the floor. I was in the front part of the ship laying on the floor, you know, ground, and every time you heard a bullet go off, it was like, oh, you know, your heart kind of stopped for a second or two because you didn't know where it was going. Well, one of the crew members got killed during that ordeal. Wayne Hodges got killed, and 12 got injured. By, by bullets? Right. Wayne Hodges got killed. Uh, he was throwing classified material over the side of the ship. It was that, you know, it was destroyed. Were they papers stuff. or electronics or? Papers, <coughs> sledgehammers on electronics and stuff like that. And so it's come out that in the last few years that Russia had something to do with this whole thing. Because you wondered what the hell a place like Korea would be, North Korea taking us. And it's come out in years where some guy by the name of Walker or something was doing a study. And the study had something to do with, uh, they wanted some of our uh, uh, intelligence gathering information. And I think that will show up in that uh, email, that long, the long one there. I started reading a little bit about it yesterday again, and I've got to go back and read some more about it. But. So the, the waters where they uh, approached the ship and started firing, those are the waters between Japan and, and Korea? Well, we were off the coast. Off the coast, on the, the We were off the coast like 15 miles is where we thought we were. That's what our records show. Well, they claimed we were nine miles out from some island. It does, miles. Some, does, and it's supposed to be 12. International waters, 12 miles. So if you're 13 miles out and you're, you know, taking <coughs> information from their country, you know, picking up signals and that. It's legal. If you're 10 miles, it's not legal. All countries have this international waters of 12 mile limit. 
So, so that's where the argument came in, why they took us and all that. But, but even on the day that the torpedo boats came, you still didn't know that you were getting your intelligence gathering, did you? No. No. I didn't know that until uh, basically we were taken, you know, that day. Maybe you started finding stuff out. I was like, what the, what, what are we doing here? You know, I didn't know where we were at or anything. Nobody really, it was kind of like, you know. So you, the, the ship tries to um, evade them, right? Go out to open sea right. and they cut them off or something? Or? They started firing. So was, you, was the Pueblo armed with guns or anything? Or? 250 caliber machine guns that were not even mounted, that we practiced on once. They were frozen. And they were frozen. I mean, this is January. It was cold outside. There was no way we were going to use them. I had practiced on them once, though. They weren't even mounted up on the ship, so it wasn't going to happen. So we were un totally unprepared. For, for the task at hand. Yeah, and basically, <laughs> other ships in the past that had gone to China and Russia off their coast and did the same things. They never were fired upon. I mean, they were escorted out further to sea or told to move on or something, but never nothing like this. There was no history to say anything like this would happen. We had another ship, like the Pueblo, that, that did this kind of mission. Not North Korea, though, other places, and nothing ever happened. So it was supposed to be a non-risk mission. You know, no, you know, not a whole lot was supposed to happen. So the, the torpedo boats kind of had the ship corralled or something? Yeah, surrounded, yeah. And then did they start talking to you or sending radio or? Send well, they over. first, uh, they started talking to us, but we had no idea what they were jabbering. We tried to get the heck out of there, and when we tried, they started firing, and then, then they started getting closer and closer to us. So we just kept trying to run for a while. After a while, after all the injuries and everything, we decided just to stop and let them board us. Because there were all those injuries already, and one guy was killed already. We didn't know they didn't live very long, so we let them board us and he took over the ship, pulled us into Watson Harbor, and they took us off the ship and down the game plank down to the ground and put us on Black. a bus, and then we went to a train station and we were on a train overnight. Blindfolded off the ship. We were blindfolded and we were in downtown Pyongyang at night. Where they had us have our hands up in the air. It's one of the famous pictures of all of us holding our hands up in downtown Pyongyang in the dark, and and they were taking pictures of us. And you almost fall off the game plank. Yeah, walking off the ship it was a little game plank, and I thought I was falling. Somebody caught me. Got blindfolded. I didn't know what I was doing. No. But it was scary because we got there. Then they took us to some place and. They said, if you follow our laws and obey our rules, everything will be okay. Well, I misunderstood them. I thought they said, uh, since you did not follow our laws, I think you're going to be done away with it. So, <laughs> it's kind of a scary thing, you know. But we were then on the train, and some guards would, were stuffing bread into our mouth, and you didn't know if you should eat it or what. Uh, most of us were spitting it out because we didn't know what the heck they were giving to us. So, so then they took us to some military complex. And we got there by blindfold, so we don't know where we were exactly at. But We stayed there for about three months, and they moved us to another complex. During those, during those three months, uh, were all the days similar to one another, or did they uh -huh. did they yeah. talk to you, or try to tell you what a great country or uh -huh. North Korea oh, yeah. was or something? We uh, we underwent the modern brainwashing. We had uh, literature to read. We had books to read. Uh, they talked to us about their country, about how nice it would be to live there. And one of the unique things that they showed us pictures of Americans that defected to North Korea. 
and I thought it was BS until about within the last year I found out it wasn't because CNN aired this uh, documentary where there's one guy that's been living there for 45 years. He got he, he went across the line from North Korea to cross the DMZ to the south during the war on his own free will, and so did three other people. They actually defected from the United States and went to to North Korea, where they endured this guy says a better life. He became a teacher over there, teaching propaganda, teaching anti-Americanism to all of them. He's still alive. He says he'll never leave. He says they've been good to me. Three others, two have died that lived there, and one went back. To, one was Japanese and went back. But uh, it's amazing what you find out over time that really is intriguing to say the least. And I mean, they, well, they showed these pictures and they were Americans and it was like, yeah, right, who the hell in their right mind would want to stay over there? You know, yeah. we were over there and it was, yeah. you know, it was terrible. You weren't getting any news from the outside world at that time, yeah, right? nothing. We got, after about five months being there, they let us get letters. Letters were sent and they gave us some of this mail and they let us send out mail. And in our mail, we tipped everybody off with these letters. They sent them like they had three copies, and they sent them through different routes to make sure they would get to them. And I think they all did get to my parents. And in these letters, we all put a lot of BS stuff in there, like say hello to so and so that was dead three years ago. And, you know, we were we were saying stuff that didn't make sense. And your dad knew that when he got the letter. He said, "What, what the heck's he talking about?" Yeah, so, but we were all sending little bits and pieces of uh, junk, so. And what was the government, what was the American government doing to get you out of there? Oh, they were negotiating at uh, the DMZ. They were trying to get us out during that whole time. But they never came in to try to get us out or anything. They just let, let us sit there. And it was like, see, we never thought we would be there very long. So at first it was like, yeah, we'll be here a week or two and they're going to come and get us. How could a little country like North Korea do what they did? You know, so it was like, it was just unbelievable what was happening. Because, I mean, if it was Russia or China, that's one thing. But when you have a little country like North Korea doing this kind of stuff, it was like, yeah, we'll be out of here soon. And, and there were t over 200 American... Navy personnel in captivity? 83. 83. 83 were on the ship. 83 were on the ship. So we, they had us all in. The officers were all in their each individual room. Both of the places we stayed, I think, were military complexes there in North Korea. But you can see out the window and you see the peasants come out at 6 a.m. doing their exercise. They live in shacks. You saw wood, men and women outside, and the and the women would be carrying all the stuff, and the men would be walking aside from them, smiling, you know. And the women were like, it's like totally different than what, our yeah. environment, you know. What about those outbuildings? The what? The outbuildings where the they would take the officers for questioning. Well, there was. See, that's what I started saying. There was uh, the officers were kept separate, and they endured the, the greatest beatings because they obviously knew they knew the most. Uh, they did get our service records. I don't think we did. I don't know. I think they totally got destroyed. I think they got partially destroyed, but I think they were able to capture information of who was who. So, uh, as far as the crew members, we were all in rooms, kind of together. Like for a while there I was with three other people and other most of the time I was with seven other people in the same room. We each had our own rack, our own bed. It was like a twin bed with a mattress this thick. <laughs> and uh, so we kind of survived the whole 11 months we were there by talking to each other. When I was having a bad day saying, this is never going to end, I'm never going to get out of here, the next guy said, ah, that ain't true. We'll be out of here in no time. And then 
Then we tried to brainwash the guards though with stuff about how wonderful America is, and some would listen and some wouldn't. So we had some guards that were very nice to us. Other guards though, they beat the shit out of us. You know, really? Stuff like that. Well, the worst of it was Hell Week. Towards the end of my 11 months there, Time and Newsweek uh, published the uh, front page that they got a hold of because they got a hold of uh, Time and Newsweek and they saw us in the picture. There were a group of eight of them and several of them <coughs> given the finger and we, they had, we had them convinced it was a Hawaiian good luck sign. And they found out it was an act of defiance and holy shit. We went through hell. I got my teeth knocked loose. We had to keep our head down like this, and I was accused of moving it a little up, so I got two fists to the mouth. My teeth, I remember wiggling them. And I still have them, but I remember wiggling them then. Didn't you so they reset themselves. You got hit in the head with a gun bar? Right. Well, I got punched twice in the face. And, you know, while I was over there, I was interrogated a couple times. And they wanted info, and it's like, I ain't telling them about it. If I have to stay here the rest of my life, I'd rather die. So I didn't tell them nothing. So, oh, you're going to be shot at dawn. Okay, and they did this to pretty much most of us. I said, okay. All those days never came. I'm here. But it was like, I don't live there. This place is a hole in the ground. America's America. America, there's a lot of opportunities. So I'm really really pro-American now in a lot of different ways and I'm very opinionated of things because of my past history. So, after 11 months, negotiations succeeded in obtaining the release of the captain. The United captain. States signed a letter of apology and then instantly repudiated it to earn our release. So we came so after this Hell Week, about two weeks later, we thought just before Hell Week we were going, there were a couple of signs that we were going home before because their treatment changed. This time the treatment all of a sudden changed and, and they started doing some things and then they told us we'd be going home. We got released on December 23rd, believe it or not. So the timing was... So the 24th, we were in San Diego with our families. So it was pretty darn neat. So did you, did you, were you sent over the border then? In, over the DMZ, the uh, a, a bus took us to the DMZ to the, near the south side where we came off the bus and uh, each person was name was read and they were accounted for. And then we went into South Korea and uh, they put us on a helicopter, took us to a naval hospital. What was the bridge called? Where we spent, it was the bridge of no return we came across. That's what it's called today. Go one way or the other, but you never go back and forth. Um, so then we, they took us by a helicopter to a uh, military hospital, and then they took us across the street from a hospital to some... <coughs> Uh, EM club, and I had the best meal that I could ever remember in my life. <laughs> it was a ham and cheese, and some chicken noodle soup, <laughs> and some coffee and orange juice. That's all I got was a gut. <laughs> <laughs> Never forget it. So then they kind of, we weren't there a long time. They wanted to try to get us home for. The holiday to be with our family. So, December 24th, we returned to San Diego. I met Governor Reagan. He was there. And they had a parade from like the, where we came in to the hospital. People lined the streets four or five deep, like a 12 mile stretch. It was really neat. <coughs> Did you have to undergo some kind of um, debriefing or they ask you to, sh to explain, share your experiences or what you should say? The uh, Court of Inquiry a couple months later convened in Coronado, Florida, where they had these uh, military officers and we all had to testify. 
I told them I didn't want to, that I knew nothing. I shouldn't have said that because then they didn't let me come home. Denial's here till the end of uh, March. And this was the end of December. A lot of the guys got to go home for a week or two, like in January or February, and then come back for the court. Well, they wouldn't let me go because I said I had nothing to say. So then when they interrogated me, though, they asked me a few questions and I was done. But during this course, they drummed up, they made this big thing up, like, oh, we gave up the ship and this and that. We were, you know, we, we were dishonorable and all this stuff. And bottom line came down that none of that stuff. They said, hey, these guys were there 11 months, they went through hell, and you're going to, you know, we all came back and, you know, we, we weren't heroes for a long time. We were detainees. For 20 some years, the government didn't recognize us because of the whole thing. <coughs> we got uh, ex POW status in the early 90s. It took all that time for them to get us that kind of thing. Any kind of VA benefits? Yeah, I was getting benefits before that, but it was very minor. It wasn't anything relating to POW status. So. The. Um I seem to remember a picture of the captain. His name was... was Boyd that? Booker. Boyd? Booker. Booker. He seemed Booker. to be... He always appeared kind of ashen in all the pictures. He must have gone through a hard time. He, the first month he was there, he was 40 years old when this happened. After a month, I thought he was 65. He definitely got worked over real well. The stories that, you know, I wasn't... He got worked over really, really well. And he, when we got back, stood behind us. I mean, in every way, shape, or form, every one of us. Well, they were going to court-martial him, right? Well, they were going to court-martial him, but they said he suffered enough. They wanted to, you know, they were talking about throwing the books at him and other and the other officers for, for, you know, not performing. For allowing the ship to get caught. Right. Yeah. Right. Protecting them still. And they really said, well, he suffered enough. So they made it all phony, like a typical, you know. So when they were suggesting that the, the captain should have fought? Right. right. He should and that have been the ship. And that would have been the end of his. It would have been the end of everyone's life. Yeah, he must be talking to me today. So the captain probably made the right call, obviously, Absolutely. right? Oh, yeah. But but the I'm always I'm bitter towards Jackson. He was the worst president we ever had in my eye, far not. He was the one, the chief executive at the time, that did nothing to get us back. I mean, he, they should have went in right away and got us. I mean, whatever. I mean, we we got enough military power. Where in a day or two we could have, you know. They had no cure. And uh, the best president we ever had in the United States was Richard Nixon. <laughs> Bar none, in my mind, I was invited to his inauguration, but I didn't go. But he was the one that I think convinced the Chinese to tell the North Koreans to let us go. I'm firmly convinced that's what happened. That's how we got released, or we could have been there a much longer time. He had a good report. He, he just got elected in '68, and then within 30 days. We were struck. Yeah. So I mean, the connections are all there. Or even before you, were, even before you were sworn in. Right. Yeah. Right. I think they were afraid. We were in San Diego when we got. Uh, he had good connections with China, and they were like, "Oh gosh, we can't mess with this guy." Yeah. So I was contrary to a lot of other people's belief. Yeah. Well. Nixon got caught. Some get caught, some don't, but they all do it. They're all guilty in one way or another, doing stuff that maybe. What um, did any of the any of the crews suffer like um, the, have a difficult time adjusting to life back home? Oh yeah, this? big time. Oh. I mean, I have, I still have issues. Uh, Any time the word North Korea comes up, I get the chills. You know, and it's okay. like, well, what's this all about now? But uh, yeah, I got post-traumatic stress disorder that I'm being treated for and. Some of the guys, though, uh, from injuries that happened later on, they, they were like, Roselle's got his, uh, his back was all screwed up. He used to hit him in the back with a two-by-four. 
because they picked on they picked on him because he was Mexican. And the blacks. And the two blacks we had. They went after them like banshees. They wanted they want they okay. went after them because they knew they were so they okay. were a minority in America and they, they were gonna make them feel them. like a first class citizen if they stayed there. They would um, put two by fours, make them kneel down, put two by fours behind their knees and force them to lean back against these two by fours, which would totally just tear your ligaments. And every time you tried to kneel up quick again, they push you but he that's what Morales told me. They he's He's in bad shape. But Mr. Morales and the other gentlemen, they they proved to be good citizens, good soldiers. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, they went there along with the officers. They were the other ones looked upon because they figured they could play on them. You could maybe get them to defect. What about the nurse? Uh, yeah. Well, while we were there, they supposedly treated us with a nurse. Everything was penicillin pills. Didn't matter what was wrong with you, that's what you got. What was her they name? Called her, we called her Flotus Blossom. Flotus. We had names for everyone there. Right. We named everyone so that we would, but every room had different names. But me and my other seven people in the room, we all knew who was who. Who? Well, who's, who's, who's the guard of the night? Oh, teacher is, or uh, uh, pig head. <laughs> One guy's face was so like it looked like a pig, a pig head, and then on and on. I mean, we had all kinds of names picked out, who he named, but we knew who was who was like. Yeah. I mean, like we played games with them, though they had. I mean, they had no like flies. Their, their air conditioning was opening the windows, so we had all these flies in the room. Because so the they gave us a little <laughs> twig with a little piece of rubber on it, and then they wanted us to kill them. This one guard, when he stood, when he stood on duty, and he would give you an extra hour of uh, uh, playing cards, or you know, uh, able to play cards, and we'd get a little extra free time supposedly. If our room was the one that, that uh, had the most flies, we had to have a we had a little cup, and we collected all these when he was a we have a big stack, and he wanted to know how many we had, so we made up. We had 128 in the next room, 100, and then whoever won, and he, he believed all this. <laughs> I mean, the stuff. We, we just, that's how we kept ourselves going. But they antagonized us. They, they, we had to clean the floors, clean, we cleaned the john. The john, they were urines on the wall. The liquid would come right out the bottom, and then they'd have us cleaning the floors. And these rats were just stinking. And, you know, so, so we had to somehow, so we, we survived by being together. If they, would have, they could have really broke us down a lot more by individually, each of us. I mean, it ain't like World War II where they put everybody in a box for a period of time and you were in solitary confinement. I was never in solitary confinement. I always had somebody to talk. So that helped the whole situation. But the officers were in solitary. Right. And, and my age, you know. I mean, I was 21 years old. I mean, you could endure a lot at that kind of age. You, you know, couldn't it was tell like, it. <laughs> it was like, you know, you, you, we just couldn't believe what was happening. The whole thing was like an unbelievable event. Yeah. A, a United States versus a, this little place. Yeah, well, you know what's so <laughs> 40 years later, they're no different. Yeah. They're still the same. If you look for any information or read about it, they're, they're the same people, except they got a new leader. They got the son running. The, the, the father died, and he's yeah. like a hero of the past. Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung died. Now it's Kim Jong-il. And he, he likes American things, so I think they... I really think they should let the country reunite, and I think we'd be better off. Look at Vietnam. That's one country. Well, why can't Korea be? I mean, those people are starving. They're, I mean, they're so backwards over there. And then 
South Korea is so prosperous with some of their companies. I mean, it would just be um, the right thing to do, human rights and stuff like that, for them to vote unite. We should get the heck out of there. I mean, we have enough there. What, what do we still got? 30 plus thousand troops there. What the hell are they doing there? Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're still, you, you're still in the service until May of 69, right? Well, yeah, 60, we got released December of 68. And then till the end of March, I was active, and then the separation papers came shortly after that for May. So May of 69, then you, you come back home? I came Six back three. home uh, March of 69, 69. here to Niles. And here, where did you live in Niles at that time? On uh, Farnsworth Drive. And, and, and um, that was a big event in Niles when you came home, right? Oh, well, yeah, about a week. That following weekend was a big event. I mean, uh, the jewels, there was a jewel there at Oakton, right near Prospect. They had a big picture in the window, and on Saturday, come and meet, come and meet me. They had cake and stuff, and they offered me a scholarship. National Supermarkets at the time offered me a scholarship. I got to go to college. I'm a college graduate because when I came back, people asked me what I wanted to do, and I go, yeah, I'm going to work in a, hey, you don't want to work in a supermarket and be on your feet, why don't you go to college? So I had scholarship from two companies. I took the one from National, and uh, uh, but they had a big homecoming that Sunday then at Notre Dame High School. They had like 450, 500 people attend, and Many, uh, Nick Blaze was there, uh, Kuczynski was there, um, uh, Stevenson, I think, was there, and there have been a couple others. But it was a big get together. So that must have helped you to sort of um, accept the experience then a little bit, did it? Was it, yeah, it was good with you psychologically, it right? Yeah, it was hard It's like your people at home uh -huh. realized what you guys had gone through uh -huh. and your. your uh, performance shouldn't be questioned in, in any way, right? right? Yeah. Right. There were a couple people here in Niles, uh, the, their names are the documents. Going back there, they started writing a book about me, and they they were handling my affairs when I came back, because I mean, I, I was in the Chicago Today for a week, and I was doing speaking engagements for like a year or two until it dried up. And they were handling all that kind of stuff for me, you know, scheduling it, and I'd go different places and make speeches. And the title of my speech was "Communism versus Freedom: The Choice Is Yours." And I had a prepared speech I'd go and give at these colleges or wherever, you know. So it's pretty neat. But it was, you know, Niles kind of. Uh, it's. Uh, they were talking about giving me a car. Well, then they did, because then they would have been having to do it to everybody else at the time. And, but uh, did you get a key to the city? I got a key to the city. Do you? Do you actually get a key? It looks does it look uh -huh. like a key? Uh huh. I think that's in that box. That's in that box. Yeah. So it's a it's a gold key, and it's got Blaze's name on it. And it says Ryder to have the key. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I got that definitely. That's yeah. sure. Now the other your other six. Um, close friends, because what comes to mind is now there's been, um, you know, treatments in, in um, books and in plays about people who undergo a uh, hostage situation and, and captivity and, how, and their friendships and how they survive the, the, the long time away from reality and uh, home. Um, did you stay in touch with the other six guys who were in your unit? Uh, not really. No, it's, it's, it's a reunion type thing. Reunion. Uh, our next one them. is next September, like I started telling yeah. you about. Last September we had one in, in uh, Pueblo, Colorado. We were in Pueblo, Colorado last September for like four or five days. We were just stop for a second here and I'll flip this. Tell them about your singing songs and the food, what the food was like. And it took some books out. About you know the, some of the crewmen wrote about the whole ordeal. Yeah, we uh, the documents started writing a book about me. They did a hundred pages or so, 
and then it never went any further. Well, what was happening was officers were writing books, and then crew members were going together, like six or eight of them, to publish a book. So I never got anywhere and tried to go solo. Well, that's what they suggested I do, and you know, so they tried to get it published and it didn't go anywhere. But there's about a half a dozen or six to ten. Six to ten least. books. Are there any ones around. in particular that you think really get it right? Are they all good? Booker's story. You know what? I haven't read most of them. I uh, bet. It's like... You, you think book, the, Mrs. Booker's Mrs. story. Um, and that's the name of, of the book. Booker, my story. Bo Booker, my story. It tells, I mean, from the minute they left San Diego till the time they came back to San Diego. And actually, it's, you know, how he was tortured, too. I mean, he was tortured the worst. Um, he lost sight when I he was a mess. But um, that's an excellent book. The officers wrote them, too, but that's telling their side. Tell them about the... January, by the way, is going to be three years that he passed away. Yeah. He died, like, at the age of 76. So did he continue in the Navy after that, or was he... For for a while, yeah. And he was mostly... He had a submarine, didn't he? Didn't he get assigned to a submarine? Or was that before the war? That was before the war. He stayed in for a while, but, you know, it's basically not... I think he was just in for a while. I mean, after something like this happened, they weren't going to really give him a lot of duties. He just Come. went around the country talking a lot about the yeah. incident and everything. Yeah. He, did a lot of that within the Navy while well, he stayed in for a while. And then after, though, he did a lot of that, though, just going around talking about everything that yeah. happened in that. Did you meet your wife during this period at all? Or? No. No, not related. Right. The, um, was there an incident later um, during President Ford's time with the Mayaguez? Uh-huh. Yeah, that was a few years after. I mean, it was very unbelievable, but the outcome was like what we thought was going to happen to us. I believe that was in 73 or 4. They captured that baby, and, but within a couple days, everything, they were released. Was it the Cambodians that captured it? I think, I think, I think yeah. Yeah, I think the Cambodians can't... Uh, took them, and there were like 20 of them or something, it wasn't as many as us, and they held them for a couple days and they released them. Yeah. See, that's what I thought was going to happen to us, yeah. so that's why it turned out to be so. So, the Pueblo, you weren't the only ship that was engaged in gathering intelligence, or do you think you were? We were not, there were others. There were others, but they, they chose to, you think they chose to make something of the Pueblo to cause an incident? Or you were doing or, or was North Korea. I think, well, that's what they're saying now, that uh, Russia was interested in some of our intelligence information, so they asked North Korea to try to uh, take us. Which would mean then that, uh, which would suggest then that there was no question that you were in too right. close. You, right. you were able seamen on that ship and you were positioned in the right place and they chose to come out and... Right. Make an issue out of it. Yeah. Right. yeah that's the way you think it, well, this, you think is, was. this came out 20, 25 years later. And, you know, little dribs and drafts are starting to be put together on this whole thing. So, but a lot of it will be on that site. I couldn't believe all that. i got to read some more of it. Because yeah. I'll, I'll know some more about it. Is it on the internet, the, the tape that we got of the interview? I got an interview, but the tour of the Pueblo that uh, that guy brought back from North Korea. Remember? We got a copy. Of the tape. Yeah, we had copies made. I got it. It's in the garage in one of those boxes okay. you put away. It's, it's a tape of an American went to North Korea, and you're not allowed to bring cameras on the Pueblo or on the ship because it's a tourist attraction, but he snuck one on. And so he narrated going through they've got the uh, bullet hole circled and you know the captain's quarters the yeah. yeah so this is something you mentioned um, before the interview the ship the pueblo today is still in north korean Water. hands it's in some port 
pure, is it still a pure game? It's a pure game, and they're powerful. And I want that damn thing back. I need to put this behind me, and that's the only way we're going to. So I want to put the word out to as many people as possible that that's my wishes, and let's do something about it. Now, Richardson, he's running for president. Bill, the Democrat from uh, New Mexico? He yeah. Was there. This was also in that article, one of our, he, he was there and he asked for the ship back and they said, well, it's possible, you know, and there were a couple times other years that we were close to getting them back and then it fell through. But I guess we're close now again because now before the end of the year, they're supposed to abandon all their nuclear, nuclear stuff yeah. is supposed to happen by the end of the year and if they do, we're going to... So maybe something could happen there. Maybe we need just a little push. Next year's an election year. Maybe we could use a little push. So I'd be willing to, you know, tell. I, I want, I want to ship that. We'd like and to get anybody that could help me that would go con go contact their congressman. I'd be interested to, you know, talk to them. We'd like to get a hold of Hillary Clinton only because she was born in, or you know, she was raised in. Park Ridge, and, which is, you know, like a neighboring town. Um, I've already contacted Obama and, uh, Durbin. and Durbin, but I don't get anywhere. You get their offices and you tell them a little bit about it. And those people really? don't know enough. You know, they're youngsters that are working at those know, offices. They don't, so they don't really they don't feel it's oh, important. Pass it on. But, so I got a letter from Durbin and it said it was, they were going to pass it through to Navy officials or something has nothing to do with Navy officials. So, I mean, how do I get to these kind of people to tell them, you know, I, I'm looking for a way to do this. Go to Channel 2 News. Yeah, you're, you're um, you'd be willing to talk to, to a newspaper person, right? Mm -hmm. If they sure wanted to interview you or something. Uh -huh. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. For a lot of years I wasn't, but now I am, because I want that shit back. 40 years is too long. Yeah. You know, a lot of years it was like, oh, well, you know, but now it's so much During all this life. time, his brother, he's got a younger brother, was also in the Navy, telling that story, that they wouldn't allow him to go on a ship because of you. Yeah, he was going to get orders to the USS Enterprise, but they got turned back because I was over there. And it was like they the wouldn't put him on a ship. They kept him in San Diego. Two people in the same family being in Tom's way, yeah. yeah. Oh. So, but he he was completed his service without incident or without right. any. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. They just kept him uh, stateside. His parents went through a lot having him as a POW. They couldn't handle another one, you know, something happening to the other one. So they kept him stateside in San Diego, correct? Yep. Yeah. Matter of fact, he heard about the capture of the Pueblo first before your parents did, correct? Yeah, he worked nights at a place called, at Park Ridge called Centel Home Company. He was working nights and he heard it on the news like at 3 o'clock in the morning. So he called them and woke them up in their sleep, told them. Before the, anyone before the media or, you know, before anybody contacted them or anything. Yeah. That's how they found out. Did your dad think you'd be coming home sooner than you did, or? I don't know. Oh, I, I think everybody kind of. He's hard to figure out. Did you think Rick would come home like in a couple months, or did you think it would last as long as it did? Uh, I don't remember, no. It was a hard time for you, though. Yeah. And, and, you know, all of Niles was behind them, you know, hoping that he would come home soon. and. His mom wrote letters to anybody and everybody she could think of, you know, to get the government to get these guys out of there. And like you said, it wasn't until Nixon was elected and Nixon having those close ties with China and now finding out that maybe China was involved, it was like, well, we better get those guys out of there. Nixon's in here, you know. So, but his, his mom wrote lots and lots of letters all over the place. I mean, to everybody and anybody that would read it. Correct? Yeah, well, she wrote the letter to the president of 
national team. That's how I got that scholarship. Right. So what school did you decide to, to go to? Uh, I'm a graduate of Western Michigan in Kalamazoo. Broncos? Yep. <laughs> yep. What did you major in, business or? Uh, Food distribution, oh. which was the supermarket business at the time. Yeah. Had you worked in the Jewel before you? Uh, uh-huh. Oh, well, you I were, worked in the National, yeah. You were a banker or a or something? Yeah. yeah, I worked at Harlem and Irving, uh, Golf Mill. I worked at Golf Mill for a while when National was there. And well, that was when I came back. They put me in that store yeah. for training before I would move on to other things and go to college and that. So you, and then the Veterans Associations, you, you belong to some of those? Or? Oh, yeah. I belong, I belong to the Veterans of Ford Moore in Elk Grove. I'm also a member of Disabled Veterans. I'm also a member of XPOWs. I do go to meetings of XPOWs, but it's way in Victavia. We get together once a month, but I haven't been for a few months, but I've gone to some of their events. And I spoke to them recently, though. They asked me to speak to them in March, and I spoke to them. Uh, telling a little bit of like today. Yeah. So if we had, experience. we don't have anything planned, but um, if there was an opportunity to speak at the library, you'd be willing to, you wouldn't mind doing that either? Is that a possibility? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. It'd be very informal. Yeah. This. Yeah. I mean, questions and answers and that kind of stuff. I could just give a synopsis a little bit. And yeah. Of what happened, and then you could, you know, questions from there. Yeah. Usually, there's a lot of questions that do yeah. come up. Yeah. Um, usually, at this stage of the interview, we ask the the, the, the veteran if their how they, their experience in the military uh, changed their lives. Do you think being in the well, I would imagine it did because you're still aware of this all the time. Changed my life a lot, a lot of different aspects. You grow up very fast. I mean, you grow up real fast. I mean, when you're 20 years old, you know, everything then in life is more serious versus, you know, not serious. I yeah. mean, going to college, it was important. I mean, I talked to people that I looked up to, and they, you know, hey, college, important. Study hard. I mean, you change your life that way, and then. Under, just going through life every day with, with yeah. stuff that comes into the picture day in and day out of, of the incident. I mean, I didn't eat rice for 20 years. He won't touch a turnip. Turnips I won't touch. We had turnips and rice and bread. That was our diet for 11 months. I lost 40 pounds from 170 to 130. Wow, your parents must have... What so I lost a lot of weight, but I was starting to gain weight as I went in the military because maybe that good. So part of that was good to take off. But there was one guy that lost 90, 90 pounds. So. Uh, it, it changes your life, and you just don't know when something's going to come up, though. I mean, now... It triggers something, yeah. It, it just triggers all kinds of different incidences. In any given week, if you talk to me, hey, anything go on, maybe there'll be nothing. But then the week after, something with North Korea, something to talk about. And as you get older, you... You won't watch just, any type of war movies. Yeah. It, they just, they affect them too much. And every now and then, he'll, he'll dream at night, and I'll hear, you know, yelling. Or, and I know it's related to that, because it only happens when something's on the news that it's upsets triggered. him. Yeah. And then that that night he'll he doesn't realize it, but I do and it's like, oh God, you know. The start of the war that we're currently the Iraqi war, that turned out to be a real nightmare for me. Yeah. With those prisoners? Yeah. With what was her name? Jessica? Yeah, the female. That really drove me crazy. I mean, I was just, everything was coming back to life. I mean, for somebody being there, you know, for, they, she was captured and then how they got her out. I mean, everything would come to life. They'd say, this is happening, this is that. Oh, well, this is what happened to me, this is what happened to me. And then, well, half of the night thinking about all this stuff. And yeah. then I started uh, having this problem with, uh, breathing, and they can't find nothing wrong with me. I've had the VA 
do everything and anything and they can't find nothing wrong with me that I have a breathing problem. But it all started right at that time with the Iraqi thing. I went to the emergency room and hey, I can't breathe. Well, they, took, they ran every test imaginable and I still got that sensation and nobody knows what it is. It could be connected. I don't know. It's, it's nutty. But there's all this, it's one that's pronounced and, and uh, I've been on and off seeing a psychiatrist to go over stuff and all that. When I think things are better, I stop. And, yeah. uh, it's, it's really a need when there's stuff going on. Yeah. When, when, the his, when stuff comes up about North Korea, it's very intense. Yeah. Well, we're honored that you came in to give your memoir today. I mean, it can't be completely pleasant, some of the stuff you're, you're thinking about it. So thank you for making the effort. Therapeutically, it's good for him. Is it? Well, yeah, because when they go to the reunions, um, some of the guys won't talk about it at all. And they're the ones that are having the worst time. Yeah. Whereas there are some, most of them I'd say now, about half to three quarters, will sit and talk about, oh, remember this and remember that. And yeah. Remember the nurse, whatever her name was, and remember that guy. That, and then I'll say to him, you never told me about that. Oh, I, he blocks or blocked a lot out. That was his way of coping with what happened. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, at the last reunion a year ago, we had this couple from Oregon that came. To, they were invited to our reunion. They were, they are the people that have been taken care of. Nobody in their family's doing it, so they started doing it. Dwayne Hodges, great, uh, great. It was all nobody taken care of, weeds and everything. They took an interest in starting to take care of it, put flowers there and make it look real nice. There's a connection there. Somebody in the family, these are friends of somebody in the family. But anyways, they wanted to come to our reunion, so we invited them. And the day we got there, after a couple hours or so, they started shooting all these questions at us. There was like 12 of us sitting in a circle, and we were answering all these questions. And this was, trying to make it this, was, this was last year in, in Pueblo, Colorado. Yeah, in Pueblo, at the reunion. At the reunion. Oh. Did, I mean, they had nothing to do with the Pueblo. They were friends. It just of, happened to, yeah. And they yeah. took care of the grave, and they brought us pictures of what the grave looked like, and, you know, did because... He, did he get any kind of medal for valor or anything, Mr. Hodges? Oh, yeah. Because he gave his life to protect this... Uh-huh. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. And then they yeah. kept, they kept him. He was released with the crew in, yeah, in a cast. Yeah, nice. The whole time. They didn't return it right away. Yeah. And then, re, I mean, that had to have been weird, I think. Yeah. Well, we have a USS Pueblo Veterans Association, a nonprofit organization. We, we, through the years, got monies from places that uh, some of the Congress people have contributed monies to our. Uh, reunions, etc., and stuff like that. And uh, when I retire, I'm anxious to go to certain places. Uh, uh, also, in Pueblo, Colorado, if you go to the convention center downtown, there's plaques outside of there with all our names on it. This was how many years? Four years ago or something? No, six. Six years ago? Yeah. They, they uh, commemorated, there's a statue, and then uh, with the with, uh, names of all of us there. Big, huge rock. Big rock and with, got with, with the, our names on it, that's kind of neat. And when the ship comes back, whenever that is, they, somebody donated land already. It's going to go there. Our water, yeah, that's good, where it's going. They're going to dig and put water in it and put the ship in the water. The land's been given, to, it's been donated to wow. us. Wow. Was the ship named for Pueblo, Colorado? Yes. Oh, I get it. Yes. We've had several reunions there. I get it. Uh, the first one was like on uh, Fourth of July, and they had a ticker tape parade on the Fourth of July years ago yeah. over there. So, but we didn't have reunions for 20 years. Nobody wanted to live this for a long time. Yeah, that's yeah. The reunions came way around, and we didn't have anyone even associated with it when I was young. The There's still some guys that will not come to them, Period. 
Yes, they never came to reunion because they don't want no part of thinking about it again. It would be too they, dramatic. They can't do it. That's what so I'm saying. there's another reunion you mentioned scheduled for for this year in next Ber- year. Next year, next year September. In, next year. Um, Right, oh, eight. Uh, right. Burlington, Vermont. Burlington, Vermont. And you mentioned something interesting about a, a play being right. developed or written and performed? Or? Right. They're going to do the play for us, and then it's going back to Washington, D.C., and they're going to do it in Washington, D.C., and they're going to see how how uh, it goes, and they may take it around the country. It'll be the second time ever. They had a play in 1971 in Washington, D.C. for a while. On the Pueblo. And there had been a movie in the early 70s. I don't know if you remember the movie. There was a movie out on the Pueblo, too. Hal Holbrook. Hal Holbrook. Played um, Booker. Booker, yeah. Is it a good film? It's a, a one man biography. It, it's Booker just sitting at a. Booker. Hal Holbrook just sitting at a table as Booker, reminiscing about the whole thing, and then flashback pictures of the crew and like the signing and the uh, virginal return, you know, they would flash pictures like that. I got a DVD that has the movie at it, it has several of our recent reunions, and it has the North Korean tour tour of the Pueblo, yeah. Of this guy that works for this radio station put these together. He combined them all into a DVD. I have that item. I, I, she put it away, so. Yeah, we're getting in the process of moving and selling our house, so I packed a lot of stuff away. But I can dig it out, I can find it. Yeah. It's, um, I wanted to do it. There's a lot of stuff now coming out because most of the guys. Well, how many are dead now? Uh, 12, 15? 12. 12? Yeah. 12 have passed away out of the 82. So there's still. Like you said, they were all younger, so there's still quite a few left. But well, it, with this play coming out and more and more information, maybe documents become declassified in time. We get the, we get more of the the real. More people will know what the true story probably was. Pro, uh, that's what we're guessing. Because she got the right address. I could send you some info on it. Oh, sure. If you want to give yeah, that. yeah. Because she got the rights yeah. to do From the time play. time to time stuff they've been sending over to us, yeah. and I might still have the one that was sent about the Vermont thing. You should get, get a hold of them out. Huh? She will tell you all about, we got call, we got uh, call about three in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking, yeah, from Larry. No, we got Called three in the morning that the, that you were released and all. Oh, the release. Okay. And you were going to be at uh, San Diego Airport. Coronado Airport. Yeah. She knew all that. Well, she and should she, come when you're interviewed because she, she, got she knows everything when, about when you were. When you got here, it was something else. You had a real a lot of a lot of people involved. John Wayne. And Oh, he's got pictures with Jaja Gabor, John Wayne. What's the lady's name? Jaja Gabor. Jaja Gabor. John Wayne. John Wayne. All sorts of pictures. Yeah, yeah the uh, song by the Tijuana Brass was our, our theme song. Uh, the Lonely Bull. Lonely Bull. That's that was our theme song. Their newsletter. They were at our reunion Bull. when we had the dance when we came back to San Diego when John Wayne was there and the Tijuana Brass. Wow. Pretty damn neat. You got an album got an from the yeah. Tijuana Brass. Yeah. It really, remember yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of neat. Yeah. As you get older, all this stuff, you know, you can't remember what you do yesterday, but you remember a lot of this <laughs> stuff because it's fond memories, a lot of it, or yeah. it's exclusive one or the other. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, um, and again, as he talks about it, he remembers more. And that's good therapy for him. Yeah. Remember Skyas? We, got, we went to the airport to pick you up. We were escorted by the police department. Skyus provided the limousine. Oh, Skyus General provided the police? Provided the limousine, yeah, right here. Oh. <laughs>
There's probably other things too. Well, I mean, there was you. You were the only one to this Remember, town, uh, so it was a big like, story. Have you lived here long, Ted? No, no. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. But I, 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 live, I live in the northwest side of Chicago, so I oh. knew a little bit about uh -huh. the suburbs. Okay, so where'd you live? Um, Cicero and uh, Irving. Irving and Cicero. I lived in Belmont, Milwaukee. Yeah. And then moved out here when I was like 18. Yeah. Oh. Just before you were drafted, or just before you enlisted? Yeah. Yeah, a year or two before that, yeah. yeah. Um, a question comes to mind now, um, did, did, did um, religion help to get the, the, the men to survive in that period? For me, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. They always say there's no atheists in foxholes, I don't know. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, definitely played a part. Yeah. Yeah, so it's when, when they're firing upon you and you don't know where the bullet's going. That brings you right there, and then it went on from there. Yeah. That's where it started. Yeah. You know, you thought you were going on to the next phase, you know. Yeah. So you started there, and then, yeah. But it was a personal thing. It wasn't anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything that uh, we all did together, you know, or anything. The threatening of being shot in the morning, um, really, for him, uh, Oh really God. turned <laughs> to God. I mean, he prayed a lot because that's how they would control these guys is to yeah. threaten them with stuff like that, yeah. right? Yeah, that came out. I brought that up at an interview at a reunion. Uh, the Pueblo chieftain ran us front page every day for a reunion last year when we were down there. And one of them, I happened to be in the picture. And the guy asked me about, uh, you know, life over there. And, it was kind of funny because I said, yeah, I was going to be shot at dawn and then the others started laughing. Yeah, you like the rest of us, you know, it was all of us. You That's know. how they tried I mean, they, to they did it to all of us, you know, like twice to me and I don't know. Yeah, but one. the first time. They were going to shoot all of us at dawn, but nobody broke. That was the neat, that was the neat thing about it. Nobody really cracked. There were a couple rumbles about stuff, but I don't think they were serious. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one would tell him, mean, you know, if anything happened, you basically had one when you come back. If, if there was an issue, you would have known about it because, uh, like one that I heard did a little talking. He's never come to reunion or anything. He passed away a few years ago. But I don't know if they kind of broke him down. He was a little one of the older people. Had a rough that's why he never came to the reunion. Yeah, that's why it would, yeah, uh, was one person, but, but other than that, I don't think nobody they didn't really break anybody down. They tried all kinds of methods. They, uh, they tried once with, uh, we called it the gypsy tea room. They had fruit and food and everything like we were to a banquet. And then they were saying, started asking us about, uh, would, you, would you think you might want to live here? We can get you a new car, any kind of woman you want, where you want to live, you pick it. And then he had all this stuff in front of us. No thanks. <laughs> then they'd look out the window and see the poverty. They paraded us all in like two or three at a time. Yeah. Like, Give us a little party for an the, hour. The picture they gave us a beer, too. We were drinking a beer, you know, they figured to loosen us up. Yeah. I mean, they tried every, you know, it's like... The, the, that famous picture where you're giving the Hawaiian good luck sign. Uh-huh. Who took that picture? With, or how did that picture get into Time or Newsweek? Did they... They took pictures of us to send back home to prove that we were okay. Well, they fixed them. So did you all do that, or just one of you, or...? There were a couple of each of the pictures. No, not all of us. Yeah. A couple of the guys in each of the pictures. Weren't they yeah. officers? No. Yeah. There were various people. I wasn't one that did that. I, wasn't, I didn't have enough gold. But well, one of them gave the picture to the Times Yeah. to print, not knowing that the North Koreans had access to the Times, correct? No, it's Time and Newsweek. Right, but how did they get the picture? Whoever that picture was sent to, somebody gave it 
Well, oh, the yeah. family members gave it to yeah. Time and Well, Newsweek. people picked, they picked up on it, obviously. Look, at what are they, it what was, are they it saying? It was a great about story. It? You yeah, know? it was a great front page story for those kind of magazines. Yeah. Well, so, then North Korea got a hold of it. So they figured through, out what it was. Brit through Britain or somewhere, for a third China country, it came back to them. Oh, man, they weren't too happy. And to this We're day, there. when they have a reunion, the guys all get together. I mean, that's the, it's like their symbol. It was on TV, and they took us, they called us up, and they came and picked us up and took us to Navy Pier, I believe, and they showed us you, you know, the picture that they had of you. Nobody had it yet. We just got it. Mm -hmm. hmm. And there was that Navy Pier. Wow. Yeah. Are you in that picture, the one that the Time magazine printed? Are you in that particular no. group? No. 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 Well, that's why I say I wanted to say it, it, there were officers that did that. There were officers. I think there was a company. I'm not sure who was in that. Because there were several pictures that were like yeah. that. I wasn't in any. The one I was in, I don't know if it even had a finger in it or not. It, uh, it, it would be in the scrapbooks. He's got two scrapbooks about this big, like this, that his mother did from the time he was captured till the time he was released. So it might be in one of those. As a matter of fact, I know it is. And next year, at the reunion in Burlington, Vermont, Vermont. You probably have you probably get to salute again, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Forty years later, yeah. they did it in Branson. They did it in Vegas. They did it in Pueblo. Yeah. yeah. We tried to have a reunion like every couple of years now. Yeah. Well, we salute you for coming in today. And well, um, no problem. Um, is it, there's anything you would like to add at this point that we haven't covered or that you think is important? That we not have I think I could think of now. I'll email you if there's okay. anything currently going on, if it's what yeah. I think it might be interesting to you, what next year Yeah. Well, thank, thank you up. for a uh, historical, uh, engaging, uh, fascinating interview, and, and you have your well, family here to add dimension to it, so I'm right. really privileged. Um, and this, you know, this would be a great uh, memoir, very informative. Thank you. Now, if you want to set something up with my father, you can do that. Um,